What I mean by expulsions is something that is different from exclusion. Exclusion, social exclusion, happens inside a system. So racism, you know, misogyny, etc., sort of inside the system. And if you can fix the system, you can sort of get rid a bit of the problem. I'm talking about something that is deeper, more disturbing, and that is that there are a set, there's kind of a proliferation of systemic edges. The systemic edge is a point where a condition takes on an extreme form, and in that same, in that same happening, it becomes invisible. So, at some point, I mean, to give very simple examples, <clears throat> The long-term unemployed, not in Sweden. Sweden is not a good country to give my talk. I just realized that. You have a lot of stuff that works in this country, but believe me, most countries in the world are not like your country. So at some point, let me say the United States, at some point, the long-term unemployed are no longer counted. At some time, the Silicon Valley techies who lost their jobs because of the crisis and now have constructed the biggest homeless encampment right there in Silicon Valley in the United States. At some point, they become invisible. Though, and and I, I, I talk about this in a whole variety of settings, including the extraordinary increase in displaced people. We call them displaced, but they're never going back home. Home is a plantation for biofuels, for palm for biofuels. Home is a luxury private city. We're building hundreds of private cities around the world. Home is a war zone. So at what point do we have to change the language and say display? Suggesting I might sometime go home is just not capturing that. I add also to this what we're doing with the biosphere. Again, you here in Sweden are so much more civilized than so many other countries. But I argue that we're actually, uh, we have managed to disrupt the capabilities that the biosphere has shown to always create balance. We, I mean, we humans have been in the business of destroying for a very long time. But the biosphere could regenerate with her own temporality. Right now, we have disrupted that capacity. So my, my, one of my chapters in this book, the one that I worked on most intensely, I must say, is dead land, dead water. I say, why call it climate change? Call it what it is, dead land, dead water. And so sort of I, I argue sometimes that we should make these jurisdictions to make them visible. Now they are invisible. It's dead land, we don't bother to go there. The 440 coastal zones that are dead, according to the scientists who do this work, we don't go there. So this question of visibility and invisibility haunts uh, a lot of the stuff that I've covered in this book. Um, now, one, 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 this is for the academics in the room, one thing that I am really now working on in the new book well, I, I, to do the kind of research that I do is, is I really need a zone that I call the zone before method. Method is a disciplining condition. Eventually, I've got to return to the zone of method. But before becoming a prisoner of, um, of method, I need to be able to explore, to discover on my own terms. I want to position myself vis-a-vis -vis the object of study the way I want. So an experimental discovery mode rather than at the other extreme, a replication mode. We need replication to construct bodies of scientific knowledge. We need that. I, need, I depend on that. But I, in my own sort of practice, I take this freedom. And, and, and one, one way of positioning that work is I don't reject paradigmatic knowledge, but rather than being in the center, which is always the strongest of paradigmatic knowledge, I sort of find myself gravitating, dwelling, becoming a captive of sort of the fuzzy edges 
of paradigmatic knowledge. And I'm having a ball, because that fuzzy edge zone is really expanding rather quickly, I would say. So, so, um, and so, so when I engage in really the little book, the expulsions book, is really sort of a set of analytic tactics. And, and so here are sort of, you know, some of them. And again, it indicates that I don't contest the paradigm per se, so, but I like to actively destabilize stabilized candidates. The state, the middle classes, the economy, etc., etc. No, no complex term is forever stable. But these complex categories require a kind of stability that coincides with certain historic periods, of course, or is generated by a certain historic period. And, and um, so I, I find myself saying, you know, there are moments, I think this is one of those moments, when you need to actively destabilize. So I actively destabilize the meaning of the state, the economy, etc. Certainly, in the shadow of powerful explanation, I, rather than being in the center of light, I want to see, or I want to answer the question, what don't I see when I invoke or use a very powerful explanation? So it's not contesting the powerful explanation. It's just saying there is a whole penumbra around that center of light. And I'm interested in seeing what happens there. And so I expose, you know, I see that I've been doing this for 30 years. And in fact, I like to to always say this, especially if there are young researchers in the audience, my first book, which is now a classic, eventually published by Cambridge University Press, was rejected by 12 publishers. So I, I sent it once, and one publisher played by the rules of the game, and then it came back, no. Then I violated, I sent it to two publishers at the same time, without ever changing a line, no. Then I said, to hell with this, to seven publishers. <laughs> Guess what? Seven said no. And then the 13th published it. You know, and I realize now that these people were not crazy. They all said the same thing. This is very good, but somehow I, can't, I don't know what to do with it. You know, I was there at that fuzzy edge of the paradigm, so to say. So, so um, that, that is, I'm, I'm saying all of this to, to really emphasize that I'm not rejecting or contesting. It is more working in that zone that is more arid, more difficult, if you want. And finally, what I really am very keen on right now in this type of work, and it is definitely a partial approach, is the notion of the making. <coughs> so I would say inequality is made, justice is made, etc., etc. That is a partial approach because we're all captives of genealogies of meaning, long histories, etc., etc. But I'm a bit brutal. And I say, I just want to capture the making. So I look at the whole question of the environmental uh, catastrophe as we made it. And here I have some slides. So I argue that internally displaced people, we made that. That didn't fall from the sky ready made. Then, oh, could the lights go a bit lower up front? Uh, can somebody, is somebody in charge? Yeah, <laughs> You never know, you know. So the ROC, this is, you all know, you're familiar with this. This is one of the most dramatic transformations. We managed to destroy billions of cubic meters of water in about 20 years. So the dark is the lake, and now there's a little, little, little thing. You stand back and you say, wow, that is amazing. You know, if you look at it as making, oh, this is so much better, thank you. Um, and the same thing here, we make that. That's an accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that there are some other processes involved, but you know, this is just sort of an emphasis. Now, <coughs> more throwing myself into the heart of the matter here, uh, one way of framing that I want to talk about is to ask, what is the steam engine of our effort? And when I ask that question and I give people a chance to think a minute, which is exactly what I'm doing right now, you, and you don't have to tell me what you think, but 
usually people come up, if they get a chance to, if I get a chance to speak, they say information technology, which is actually a very reasonable answer. They are present everywhere directly or indirectly. They have huge shadow effects. They alter, you know, from our logics to social logics. But I say no, partly to sharpen the discussion and partly to get at this moment. Because information technologies have made a difference. They're going to stay around. And so I say it's finance as capability. And here what I want you to just take in, I'm not going to give you a lecture on finance, I'm just going so this is a capability for me. Two or one, this is under a trillion. I know in Europe they use the zero separately. Anyhow, under a trillion. Six years later, it's 62 trillion. Think of anything that has that growth rate. This is just one instrument of finance, a particularly powerful and toxic one, creditable to us. We don't need to go into that. So I argue, you know, this, and, and then, by the way, I should elaborate, 62 trillion at that point in 207 is more than global GDP in the world. Plus, it is, um, you know, it only some of that, plus it is like 10% of the total value of finance in 207, that is the crisis, which is 630 trillion, uh, which is a lot. You know what I mean? And then the other question that I've researched is, was there actually what we call currency? In other words, money issued by central banks. How much actual, and it was about like, you know, 200, I mean, uh, uh, I can't remember now exactly, uh, 200 trillion at most. So when I say capability, I mean that it is something that is really capable of producing something which we monetize, but it is not. And, and so one distinction I like to make is that the traditional bank sells money it has. Finance sells something it does not have. And in that selling what it does not have lies its need to invade other sectors, which makes it dangerous, potentially, and also uh, the, the complexity that it has, the extraordinary use it makes say, of the math of physicists. Finance doesn't know what to do with the, with the math of microeconomics. Forget it. That's just not, but it is the math of those who track what cannot really be known, physics. So, so it is a capability and it's a dangerous one. I also, as a footnote, like to say, if we could only pull it down, it makes all of this money. You know, it is, can we monetize it? It creates that value. Can we pull it down and transform it into, you know, a green transport system, <laughs> social housing, again, stuff that you don't need in Sweden, but we need it in much of the world. This is another element I'm just going to pass by. Now, here I want to show this, this notion of finance as capability and that it develops instruments that allow it to invade all kinds of sectors, including very modest home mortgages, and cause destruction because it invades them in order to extract. And again, I want to repeat, traditional banking, we all need it. It's a good thing. Finance makes capital. If we could only pull it down and materialize it into something good, we would be fine too. But it is too powerful, and it does not govern itself well either. That is why we have a super crisis. Now here, very quickly, I am not going to develop all of this, but I just want to emphasize the fact modest houses used to generate a mortgage that could work for the high finance circuit. The challenge was to de-link the instrument, which was a mix of mortgage and high-grade debt, from the actual <laughs> asset, the little house, because that would have ruined the prestige of the instrument. Little house in there? No, no, no. Asset. The agents who were doing this at one point needed to, in order for it to all work, the intermediaries, to, to get 500 contracts signed. Basically, all they were signed, signed, you can do it. Five years, you don't pay anything. It was not, nothing to do with, uh, with the mortgage itself. It had to do with the notion of an asset-backed security. It took 16 complex steps to produce that, to delay from the little house, from the little mortgage, make it invisible, 
just have a contract signed, asset, and then to make it work. Those 16 steps were done by brilliant minds. This is one of the themes in my book, how often very complex forms of knowledge that we admire in our current epoch wind up producing some rather elementary brutalities. And this is one example. Now, here are here is the effect of all so these are foreclosure. Foreclosure doesn't mean that you're out of your house, but you have notice to say that you are in deep trouble. According to the to the Central Bank of the United States, this is the US now, 13 million households have been thrown out of their homes. Short, brutal history, you know, of less than a decade. These are yearly things. This is not a and it goes on. See this first half of 2014, another half million. Now, uh, here is a map, so the high point is 209, 2010. It was in 207 <coughs> that this instrument was declared illegal in the United States. But the effects <coughs> kept going, and they are still there. The 2014 should be left here. Europeans tend to think that it isn't happening in Europe. It is. This is a formidable instrument. It's brilliant. You can do anything, D-link, and... So here we have, and what I love to point out, is that the much admired Germany, has, these are yearly numbers now, this, these numbers are much smaller, etc. The worst case is Hungary. Hungary has now, the, the, the data actually go on, uh, a million households out of their homes. That's a lot for Hungary. And as you can see, the nice countries, not Sweden, Sweden is somewhere in here too, I think, but I'm not sure actually. But even Denmark and the Netherlands. Netherlands is a little less nice, I would say, now, nowadays than Denmark. But those are little comments just here. Now, um, this is the other side of the coin. Massive investments, national and global, into property markets of cities. And I say, at what point is this the buying of urban land? How do you buy urban land? You buy it by a building. Now, these are just, this is just one year, okay? 55 billion. Year after year. This is just property. This is not developing sites. And here, I have a list of 100 cities. This is my a new little project I'm doing that I call Who Owns the City? And again, I don't want to work much on this. And here is, here is sort of a fuller list that you can see. These are the high recipients, but it is, oh, if you look at the 100, it sort of stays at this level. This is, a, this is a development that has taken off in the last few years. So, and of course, we also have the building of new cities. And this is, if you just take foreign investment, so London is a top. Now, for instance, in New York, not a hint on the Chinese, but one of the biggest government companies just bought in New York. A huge plot of land, which we call Atlantic Yards, that was sort of transport, warehousing, and some manufacturing, but mostly warehousing. And it's going to build 14 enormous blocks of apartment building. I say that de-urbanizes the city. Now, the reason I'm showing the mortgage foreclosures and this clearly the juxtaposition, right? Um, and now there is, as a footnote, even more pushing of people out of their homes. If, they, if you are in debt, out, out, out you go. We have in the global south land grabs. We all are familiar with that, I assume, right? The last five years, 220 million hectares. Properties only that are 200 hectares are included. In these investments, only properties that are over five million, at least in New York and London, five million dollars. Anything that is below five million out. So, so I would argue that what we're seeing, we're sort of expelling land, urban land, from the city. We're not literally moving the land, but we're de-urbanizing our cities. Now, I care about this because I think the city it's one of the places, the real city, not just build up density. But those without power get to make a history. They get to make a culture. They get to make an economy. Think of immigrants in, 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 in cities, for instance. So I find these trends coming together rather disturbing. And 
and I have now spoken with enough sort of I play I play dumb. I can't quite say dumb blonde anymore. I but when I bit dumb gray, you know, ever. Uh, and they think, you know, land right now, urban land, buying pieces of a city, it's the best investment. Many of the properties are empty because it's just holding capital. It's an investment. Uh, now, critical element in the story that I'm saying on the financial part is a question of debt. So here you don't need to look at all the numbers, but just a few. So I first, I'd like to point out the title here, ratio of household credit to personal disposable income. Credit sounds really nuts. There is debt. We tend to think of it, we have that to spend. Well, yeah, but it's debt. Now, this is a short brutal history. This is a critical epoch, eh, when a lot of what I describe sort of takes off. This, the data comes from the IMF staff papers. The IMF staff papers I am, are amazing stuff, by the way. That doesn't always get published. And from 2000, Czech Republic 8.5, Hungary 11.2, very, very reasonable. At that point, the United States was already over 100%. Eh? So, and Spain, by the way, 65 and zero growth. Now, two, five years later, look at Hungary, <coughs> well, Czech Republic, 27%, uh, Hungary, almost 40%, etc., etc. Now, having some household debt is fine. It is a bit disturbing how quickly this has gone. And if you then put it together with a million people out of their homes, in uh, or households out of their homes. Now, in then the United States then went up to 132. Spain, no, 65. Here you have to Spain, over 100%. Germany, on the other hand, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, 70. I can come comic opera. So, now, the question then for me is, who owns that debt? These are households. These are not corporations. We're talking households. If a, a local bank owns your debt, that means it owns the interest that the community can pay. And there will tend to be a recirculating of that. So you build up. You know, what is a loan for one becomes some more, you know, might become another job at the little bank, so to say, to put it that way. So I checked again in the IMF papers. Who owns that debt? Now here I just have a few. Look at, look at, this is Hungary. 40%? Foreign owned, foreign banks, German, Swiss mostly, and Austria. That is not good. Now where the, where the rest is, we, we don't, you know, that's too, too difficult. But this just gives you an idea that, that, you know, that means a loss, that means loss. And we have had this cycle in the United States, for instance, for 20 years, and it can destroy a neighborhood. It can, you know, a, a, a part of a city, you know. And um, so again, these to me are very negative. Uh, these are very negative trends. Now, here I'm going to skip this, but it's amazing, I can't resist. This is London housing, we up there, high, right? And, uh, but you can't see the, the colors well enough, it's not worth, I'm going. Here, all I wanted to emphasize, this is a debate that, that I'm sort of having. <coughs> this is Germany, etc. you know, this dip is not just Greece and Spain. It's far more systemic. You cannot simply attribute it to the wrong policies. So as you can see now, Germany, of course, comes out much higher on the throne. But the dip is a structural dip that is part of these economies. Some can handle it better than others. Now, this is a bit of a footnote, but not completely in the sense that we are seeing certain types of trends happening uh, in many of these countries. Um, now, here I want to show you another, another story, and that is corporate profits after tax in the United States, 1940 to 2010. Now, this flat line is not because nothing was happening. It's just that it was below the billions. Huh? A lot of stuff was there. So it's just a, you know. But look at this. So there is a bit, you know, it goes up, up, up in the 1990s, 1980s. It goes up, up, up. It falls. There is a little crisis for about two hours. It's more like, you know, two years. But, and then it goes higher. And if I track it further, it goes higher than it was before the crisis. In the meantime, those households, part of the economy, you know, so you have really 
divergences that are very, very marked. And here, look at this, corporate assets, they didn't even register. And it just goes higher and higher. The crises, you know, here and here, you have a little, little bit of a dip there, you know, it's up for a second, and then it goes on. Now that tells you that we have multiple dynamics at work in these economies. It's not that there is one that can pull the others. This doesn't pull anything. It just takes and then it moves on. The United States is the extreme case. I know that in Sweden, I know the data, but I, would, I prefer not talking about the country I am talking <laughs> in. Uh, you know that you have a very high concentration of wealth. It, it is constituted differently, but it has grown a lot. Do people know the data? Some of you must know the data. Right? I should have added the data. I can see that I prefer reading it. Now, at the same time, our governments are getting, look at Germany, 13%, this is debt, you know, to GDP, 44 you know, they, our states, would many of our states, even the solid ones, would not be able to do what they did in the 50s and in the 60s in terms of infrastructure. In the United States, we have 6,000 bridges that are going to fall. It's not a question, will they? They will. There is no money to fix them. That is astounding. Now we spend, we put it in other places. We know that too. Now this is a beautiful graph that captures a history of a century, and I always tell my students, this is something you should not forget, this graph, because it tells a tale. So this is 100 years, more or less, you know, 1917, and then it goes to 2010, the census. And this is the share. This is one line that tells a tale. I love that capacity rather than, you know, all these numbers. So it, it, the top 10% earners, and that is not inherited wealth, that is not capital gains, that is just what your jobs pay you. So it tells a tale about jobs. 47% in the year when the crisis comes, falls the wonderful, the adorable Keynesian years, it falls to 33, that's still pretty high, mind you. But you know, it means it indicates indirectly the growth of a middle class, the growth of a prosperous working class. 1987, I was making this argument in the 1980s when I was writing Global City, we're going, well, this is changing and nobody accepted that and then it goes back up as if nothing. When you read the literature of this period, that is the important point here. You have the sense that we found the algorithm, we're never going to give it up. And then before we knew it, it was gone. This was made. It was made by outsourcing, via deregulation, via privatization, while destroying the unions, via etc., etc. Mass manufacturing gets outsourced. You know, there, there is a whole story to be told, and I'm sure many of you know that story for your own country, so I'm just going to continue. Here's another version of it. What I want to point out here is the fact that here you have all this growth, and the bottom 40%, barely anything. This story is invisible. This story of this, very visible. Gentrification in cities, a very visible event. The, if, the, if the middle classes, the same little houses, neat facades, if they get poorer, that might just be invisible. The facades, facades don't change. So this story that these 40%, the chattering classes, as we call them in the United States, they picked up on this. They just said, oh, everything is getting so good and upgrading the cities. And remember, New York City was literally broke in the 1970s, so it just reinvents itself. Uh, now, here are other measures of wealth, how extreme it is. I, I just want to move on very quickly. These are all great data. Uh, now, the other element uh, is this notion of urbanization. A big word. I'm getting very tired of it. Very, very tired, especially when politicians say, you know, more people live in cities. And so for me, the question is, what don't I see when I say urbanization? Right. And I think we have to ask ourselves these questions. These very powerful categories are really invitations not to think. And sometimes we need that. We need to be able not to think about it and to say, oh, you're talking this and this. I make the same argument about immigration, for instance, right? Now, what we're not seeing is the story of land grabs in the global south. Getting back to land. I want to emphasize that when the crisis begins to emerge, which is really between 206 and 207, the conoscenti, those who belong to the system, to the financial system, uh, became major investors in that. 
Goldman Sachs bought land in Russia, JP Morgan in Ukraine. Hedge funds for about six months were the main buyers of land in sub Saharan Africa. They clearly weren't buying land because they wanted to be farmers. Just the issue was land becomes a valuable asset. We can speculate it. At that same time, 207, you see the prices of food rise by over 200%. Commodities, eh? in other words, what you put <coughs> in the, finan the financializing of commodities, not just commodity. Commodity is like when grain, coffee, when you have a lot, very standardized, etc vast quantities, so you can, but what you see happening then also is the financializing of commodities in order to really make money. And that question of land then hangs in there here very quickly. So I'm sorry that you didn't show very well. Africa is the main, but you know there are, uh, and it's happening also in Europe, in France, those who are doing the research tell me that many of the sons and daughters of farmers, and farming in France is serious work. It's compelling work, etc. cetera. Uh, they now, because there are not many good jobs, they want to become farmers. They can buy land. They cannot buy land, buy, but land has been bought up. In the, United, in, in the UK, in the north of the UK, the owner of HM, isn't HM your wonderful company here in Sweden? He has bought vast stretches of land in, in Wiltshire and I don't know at all. The Mormons of Utah, I bought land in Cambridgeshire, which is very wet, so I keep thinking it's because Utah is so dry. They're saying, let's go buy some wetland. I mean, these are all these micro histories that are happening. Now, by, I, I have nothing against foreign, you know, the foreign, as in foreign investment. But what I'm seeing is an enormous amount of capture of something that used to be small and sort of, you know, interactive, moving towards other scales. So, and then here, one of the, the critical item here for me is that most of it is not for food. Most of it is for industrial crops, biofuels, basically. That means you can use all the pesticides and all the whatever fertilizers that you want, which means that the shadow effect of the poisoning of land and water is huge. People who are not small farmers who are still there, they, they, might, they have to leave because the, the, the poisoning goes well beyond the plantation. I should also say an image that I would like to leave you with. I'm sure that you know it's not an original image, but what happens when a country buys? And we're dealing with about 15 countries in this period. 15 countries and about 100 firms. I have it also more or less listed in the little book. Uh, 2.8 million hectares to grow for biofuels. Well, first there is the eviction of floras and faunas. You get back to just an act and clean that. You evict all kinds of sort of rural manufacturing districts, village economies, genealogies of meaning, cultural practices, uh, knowledge about plants, about earth, about stones, etc. Out, out, out. And then in the shadows of urbanization, where do those people go? They go to cities. They go to the slums of cities. Secondly, we now still know. But you know what? Very soon we forget, and they become part of the urban slums. Their, their rural histories, rural culture, cultures, their, their knowledge of the, of the plants and the stones and the earth. And then, out, out, forgotten, Eurasia. They are just slum dwellers. And forgotten is because those those growers are maybe poor, but they you know they know the stuff. Anyhow, so many histories. Uh, now here I'm not going to dwell on this. Uh, it's all fantastically bad stuff. But I want <laughs> really. But I want to sort of end. I'm looking at that enormous clock. I mean, high clock. It's just, anyhow, so so. Um, and I want to come back to this notion of unstable meanings. And I want to focus on one little item because there is a lot. Um, again, the way that I have depicted is either directly people are expelled from wherever they have their house, their plot of land, they're indirectly 
confined to more reduced spaces. Insofar as you have the privatizing of much land in, in cities, the elimination of little squares and little parks, you know, to put a mega project that privatizes or opens the city. Uh, the building of no gated communities, kind of private, you know, China's planning 400 cities, in India 100. A lot of, you know, privatizing. Office parks are not cities. Gated communities are not cities, so you lose that complexity. So, so one issue that, and I mean it as something that cuts across immigrant, citizen, poor, rich, etc., is uh, the question of membership. And to put it sort of sharply, uh, rather than looking at those who are most oppressed, like some immigrants, etc. I want to look at us, citizens, we're supposedly, and sort of ask, who are we, the citizens? And I want to show you this map, and I'm, can I ask who has seen this map? It's in the public domain. This is 10,000 plus buildings uh, that are engaged in full time gathering of data about all of us who are, even if you're there for two days. Oh, my, you know, wind up in there, some information. And now, again, I repeat this in the public domain, etc. And um, when I used to show this before Mr. Snowden to people, to audiences, they, they really didn't know, uh, there was no sense of what that means. Again, there is the facticity. It is not enough to produce meaning, you know? So now, after Mr. Snowden, they begin to understand. So this is quite an interesting story here, and I should probably quickly show. Now, in, in Washington, they keep building. They have now built most of it. But look at this. Together, these, these buildings, 33 buildings, 17 million square feet, the equivalent of almost three pentagons. The Pentagon is very, very big, huh? Or 22 US Capitol buildings. The Capitol being the house of democracy. So what you have, you understand the irony, right? So what you have is, is this stuff watching us all you know, 22. Now, back to the map. The logic of this system is that to keep us safe, we first all have to be suspect. <laughs> That's the logic. <laughs> you know, the aim is supposedly to keep us safe. And one, one question one might ask is, might there be better systems, right? Um, second point, which is I find very interesting and actually almost adorable, it's, it's very international among the million who have top secret clearance. It's over a million now. So if your best algorithm builder is an Indonesian, she's there, a Russian, there. Very international. I sort of like that. But the irony then really does become, and if you now give a narrow definition of citizen to, you know, resident immigrants and your average level, citizen, you know, um, who are we? Who are we? What is the meaning of being a citizen? When you have that wonderful international setup, all those machines, and you're suspect for your own security, we are an altered subject. Now, I would like a little study that I have is um, about rights. I've been writing about this for 20 years. Who gains rights and who loses rights? So when I began to see when I started my work on globalization in the 1980s, that uh, firms were really gaining rights. We have given firms a lot of rights. And if this transatlantic and the trans-Pacific treaties are signed, we're giving them even more rights, private justice. They cannot, they don't want WTO because WTO, the state, can do something. This, private justice. So anyhow, and, and we have lost rights. In fact, I will end with a little story, which is uh, my husband, Richard said, some of you may know him, an adorable husband. He, uh, he's been saying, I mean, this is, now goes back to exactly 1996 is when this happens. And he said, Saskia, you work too hard. He's always saying You need a hobby. Now, I grew up in Latin America, and I swear, honestly, I don't know exactly what hobby is. <laughs> I just don't know what that means, you know, hobby. What, what is that? Now, I am engaging terms, you know, in concepts. And, um, and then I came across 
Clinton, President Clinton, <coughs> signs his new immigration law in 1996. And in that law, which is called immigration law, so those working on citizenship never looked at that because it's about immigrants. Well, he took away rights from us citizens, particularly the right to sue the immigration service in a lower order court where we have standing, we the average citizen has standing. So I went to Richard and I said, Richard, I have my hobby. <laughs> I'm counting all the rights we're losing. He of course said, that's not a hobby. But anyhow, I leave you, I leave you with that thought. Thank you very much.